So good evening, everyone, and welcome to uh, tonight's presentation, Black Patriots in Washingtonville Cemetery with Joe Moore and Sherry Price Bruin. Um, my name is Matt. I'm the head of reference and adult services at Moffitt Library of Washingtonville. I'm also our local history librarian. Um, this is a series of talks that we planned, um, I want to say, back in January, and we, the, with the goal of maybe highlighting local organizations um, or people who are really doing some really great work in our community and in our region that can maybe shed some light on some forgotten topics or topics that aren't really discussed. Um, we're going to also be dedicating this series for the entire year to um, our late historian, uh, Linda Standish, who was a village historian for many, many years, also very active in the cemetery community. I'm sure many of you are aware of that. And I'm gonna let you know, uh, Joe kind of explain more about some of the work that the cemetery does if you're not familiar with it and maybe ways that you could donate. Um, but with that, um, I'll leave the floor to Joe and Sherry and enjoy the rest of the presentation. All right. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Black Patriots in Washingtonville Cemetery. And thank you, Matt, for asking Sherry and I to do this webinar. We are always, always happy to talk about these guys. And as if you were here early, you might have heard us. We keep going forever if we get started. <laughs> so, and as such, um, I do, I apologize if I don't like look at the screen and actively engage you. I have to read off my notes or we'll be in 1865 forever and I'll not get through any of this. So I have to kind of uh, stay on track here. So um, my screen will start. There we go. So my name is Jill Moore and I just want to briefly introduce myself. I am a history major at Empire State and I'm also a professional genealogist. I did teach genealogy at the Moffitt Library and I'm a member of the Washingtonville Cemetery Committee. I also professionally clean headstones and lead headstone cleaning seminars with my fellow cemetery committee member, Colleen McCardle. Um, though I'm originally from Ohio, my family tree absolutely exploded about the same time uh, the military moved us to West Point. And I was happy to discover uh, that my own paternal roots reached back to the Revolutionary War and started right here in Blooming Grove, right off of Tuttle Road. Um, the Strongs, Woodhalls, Howells, and many more that lie in the Washingtonville Cemetery are my cousins. It's an absolute honor to be able to care for their graves and those of Sherry's family, along with everybody else that's there. Uh, joining me tonight is Sherry Price Bruin, who was born in Goshen. While she resides now near uh, Orlando, Florida, her roots and heart are here in Orange County where her family has lived for over 200 years. After a career in the restaurant industry, Sherry enjoys retirement where she can focus as much as she wants on genealogical research. She has built over 75 family trees for herself, her family, her friends in search of ancestors. Today, she'll share stories of four ancestors that are buried here in Washingtonville. Sherry and I met through Ancestry as I endlessly pestered her and her cousin Stephanie for information about the men we'll be talking about tonight. As I started to research these men to properly identify them in their military service, I found Sherry's tree online. Without Sherry and Stephanie and their wealth of knowledge about their families, I would not have been able to do my job at the cemetery. I thank both of them endlessly for being so patient and so giving with me and sharing the information so freely. As Matt said tonight, um, would not be possible without the Village of Washingtonville historian Linda Standish and this present this presentation is dedicated to her as she sadly passed away January 16th. Without her, her knowledge and her genuine interest in the lives of the people who lay within the grounds of Washington Bell Cemetery, a good portion of tonight's presentation would not have been possible. She was always curious, always learning, and was particular eager, particularly eager to piece together the stories of the lives of the Black soldiers who were with us. Our work at the cemetery will continue on in her honor, but we will miss her endlessly. And I also wanna take a moment to forewarn you that tonight's presentation might include some offensive and outdated language. The words that you hear are not meant to cause distress or outrage, and we do not use them lightly or without reverence to the pain in which they cause. It is to place them appropriately into the prejudice era in which these men and women lived and fought. And before we get started, I just wanna say, please hold your questions till the end of our presentation and we'll be happy to answer any that you might have. There is a joke in the genealogy field about a relative asking you if you're ever done researching your family tree as you've been working on it for eons. The answer is always no, you're never ever quite done. And as such, this is a work in progress too. I had searched for countless months through every newspaper that I could find online and just last year, wouldn't you know, 
the Goshen Independent was put online finally through Fulton History, and it opened up a whole new world for Sherry and I to research. We've been finding things that we never heard of before. So I would like to add this presentation is a continual work in progress, and these are things that we found to date. Maybe someday we'll have a part two to this webinar. Before we dive into the stories of the soldiers of the cemetery, we have to rewind a bit and talk about the cemetery's formation. In 1854, the church decided that they needed a burial ground for their parishioners. And in 1855, the Honorable Robert Denniston, who was one of the church trustees, drew up the map of the cemetery and laid out the plots. Each plot has 16 graves, and each plot started at $30 minimum, depending on which area you choose. I think some were more desirable or premium than others, much like today and some of the bigger, fancier cemeteries. That $30 equates to just shy of $970 in today's money. While there are 140 individual plots here laid out, we'll be paying attention to the empty, empty rectangle at the top there. If you look at this current map of the cemetery, not much has changed since 1855, other than we added on about eight more acres through the years on the left of the original cemetery footprint. The entrance is still in the same spot off North Street, and you still have to come up through a line of trees in the drive next to our old, our old manse. But what I want to point out here is that now that blank rectangle at the top from the old map has some plots laid out on it. And I know this will sound horrible, and it was, but remember this was 1855. Represented by the blue star, that back rectangle section became, for lack of a better term, an unspoken segregated black section. <laughs> While segregation is a painful past, it's important to remember that it was a reality for our black soldiers and their families then. For our research purposes, it made identifying where they were buried simpler. Today, aside from a few random white burials in that majority of that back section, is filled with descendants and relatives of our black soldiers. Throughout the 20th century, the cemetery has been pleased to welcome more black burials throughout the cemetery, and most recently even received its first Russian Orthodox burial. The cemetery is actively working to continue to honor these men and reconcile the past prejudice and actions of the first cemetery trustees. So who were these men who so bravely stepped forward to answer the nation's call? The statistics are impressive. There were 170,000 black soldiers in the Union Army and 19,000 who served in the Navy. An estimated 119,000 former slaves served in the Union forces. If you're curious, on the Confederate side, it's estimated between 3,000 and 10,000 10, black men served. 10,000 black soldiers died in battle and 30,000 died from disease, but we'll touch about more on that later. Black soldiers served many roles, infantry, heavy artillery, light artillery, cavalry, and engineering regiments. Black men and women could serve in medical roles as cooks, laborers, carpenters, and even as scouts and spies. The cemetery has identified 17 known USCT members and one reported African-American nurse, the wife of two of our soldiers. If you don't know, the USCT acronym stands for United States Colored Troops. If you're in the cemetery and visiting these men, you might notice that some of their new VA headstones say USCI, for colored infantry. If you look at the chart here, the men are listed in alphabetical order and then color coded to show what regiment they belong to. It's probable that even for those who weren't related to each other directly, either by blood or marriage, that they knew each other within the community. Sherry will elaborate more, will elaborate more on the relationship between these men later. Of these men shown, most served in infantry or heavy artillery capacities, while a handful served as nurses through Rikers Island. Sherry, Linda, Standish, and I have all pondered what would entice a black man to join the fight without going into a huge history lesson about Lincoln and his reluctance to lead the movement towards enlistment and arming black soldiers. Just know that citizens in our nation and even countries abroad were wondering if African Americans were ever going to join in the fight. Slowly they joined first in the Navy as auxiliaries, but as the war eked on, everyone was watching on tenor hooks to see whether or rather when Lincoln would be forced to let the black men join. In this rather racist cartoon from London, Abraham Lincoln is depicted extending a gun and ammunition to a black man, calling on him as an old friend and asking him to lend a hand as if he suddenly owed the United States a favor. On August 25th, 1862, just two weeks after this cartoon, 
the Secretary of War Edwin Stanton authorized Brigadier General Rufus Saxton in Beaufort, South Carolina to arm, uniform, equip, and receive into service up to 5,000 volunteers of African descent. Even when the African Americans were allowed to join the service, there was still the question of why should they join? Frankly put, the Confederate Congress made it inherently dangerous to join the service. In May 1863, the Confederate Congress issued orders that it was death for every white person who commanded, armed, trained, and organized Black soldiers in open aggression towards the South. And as the act further says, any Black soldiers captured will be dealt with, which meant the threat of being turned over to slavery or even death. The many African Americans could not read or write, they were sure to have known from the reporting in the Northern newspapers and the talk around town that death surely awaited them should they venture south to fight. This ad from March 1864 spells it out quite plainly, hanging, torture, and massacre. That threat became real a month later in April 1864 when Confederate troops overtook Fort Pillow and massacred 300 of the 567 soldiers there slowly and deliberately throughout the night. 200 of the 300 dead were Amer African American. Multiple witnesses survived to tell the tale of this ruthless massacre before a congressional hearing, but Fort Pillow, rather than scaring off the black soldiers, became a rallying cry to remember Fort Pillow. These recruiting ads and posters spread throughout the North and to meet their quotas, towns and cities were paying handsomely. To lowly farmhands and laborers, a bounty of $600 would have been quite a temptation. $600 in 1863 would be the equivalent of nearly $13,500 today. While some African Americans did join the service for money, others joined in the hopes that they would be granted citizenship and voting rights following the war. It's also been put forward by battlefield historians that some wanted to prove their manhood, some wanted to prove their equality to the white man, and that many wanted to fight for the freedom of their people, both in the North and the South. And though we cannot possibly cover all 17 of our USCT soldiers today, we can share some amazing and interesting stories about some of the lives and also give examples of the trials and tribulations they and others experienced while in service. African American records are problematic, even to the most seasoned researcher, and it takes all the skills in your toolbox to piece together their lives. To do so, we use various censuses, town and clerk's records, pension files, probate files, muster cards, newspapers, and a slew of other bits and pieces to reconstruct their lives as best as we're able. Let's start with one of my favorite people in the cemetery, William Halsey, who was a private in Company B of the 20th USCT. If you followed the cemetery blog, you might have seen that William was one of the first people I wrote about. William's story will overlap slightly with that of his brother Anselm, who is also in our cemetery as well. Both brothers enlisted in December 1863. William would be sworn in first into the 20th and his brother Anselm in the 26th USCT. Both units were raised up and trained on Rikers Island long before it was the prison we know today. The black soldiers camps were cramped, filthy, cold, and ill-equipped to house men in the dead of New York winter surrounded by water. Disease was rampant and Anselm, having enlisted a few weeks after William, would never leave Rikers Island as he sadly passed away from disease in February 1864, just months after enlisting, and his body was sent home to Washingtonville for burial next to their mother. The document on the right is the first muster card associated with William, and on the left is his New York State Muster Roll abstract, which is a basic summary of his time in service. From both, we can see that he enlisted on December 9, 1863, in New York City for a term of three years. While these are great beginning documents for any military research uh, and taken at face value, one would imagine that William made the trip to New York City to enlist and then off he went to Rikers to join the other members of the 20th USCT. However, William's story is far more interesting than can ever be summed up on a muster card. From a document we found in the National Archives, William told his own tale. In December 1863, he was met on the street in Goshen by a man named Tip Little, who inquired if he would like to enlist in the Union Army. William told him that if he could get the same $450 bounty that others were getting, then he would be willing to enlist. The man informed William that the men were only getting $350, which William still found agreeable. William went home with Tip Little and had a friendly dinner with him before they departed by train for New York City. 
What William didn't know at the time was that this new friend, Tip Little, was one of the most devious predators of the age, a bounty broker. Towns, pay, towns paid finder's fees to these recruiting agents to go and find people to fill their quotas. These bounty brokers went to great lengths to abuse the system for quick, easy cash from unsuspecting people like William. Their methods were ruthless and cunning. These men were drugged, enlisted while unconscious. Prostitutes were hired as wives or mothers to enlist drunken prospects. They made promises of furloughs that never came. They offered men regular labor type jobs and then had them sign enlistment papers instead. And then they were promptly carted off to serve their terms. The brokers would promise to send bounty home to their waiting families only to pocket the money instead, or they would just outright lie about the amount of bounty to be paid and pocket the difference. From William's letter, written with the help of an educated black chaplain on Rikers Island, we learned that after William and Tip Little arrived in New York City, they went to the recruiting station where he was examined, signed his enlistment papers, and was sold into the 20th. Tip Little then handed a roll of money to William, but then when William enrolled it, instead of finding the $350 bounty that he'd so willingly agreed upon, he only found $25. Thinking that it must have been a mistake, he showed the money to both Tip Little and the lieutenant who had sworn him in, but neither of them said anything to him about the monetary discrepancy. Instead, he was handed over to the guard and was sent to Rikers Island the next day. William would go on to write that all the bills except two I afterward found to be such as I could not pass. As awful as that is, William's tale was not unique by any means, but his testimonial letter was used to help bring an end to the bounty broker profession. One of the little mysteries in our cemetery was how did two of our men end up serving in the Rhode Island 11th USCT? Initially, we thought perhaps they relocated here after the war. Henry DeWitt's headstone offered no help at all other than to give us his regiment. John Earls was a bit more detailed, so that gave us a bit more to work with while researching him. As it turns out, we found our answer in the Middletown newspaper in a recruiting ad that ran in August 1863, looking for New York black men to come and enlist in Rhode Island's troop. While the editor could have just simply published the recruiting noter, he chose the opportunity to get a bit snarky and racist saying, an excellent opportunity for colored men to serve their country and at the same time help themselves. Will not many of this class in our town and county heed this call and embrace this opportunity? In no way can they so surely and speedily contribute to their own elevation and the public esteem and securing the, their own rights by enlisting at once. He then asked, who has a larger stake in the issue of the great struggle in which we are engaged than the colored race? Using John's regiment, we were able to find his enlistment papers and we can see that John must have been aware of the Rhode Island ad in August because two weeks later, on September 1st, John enlists in Providence in the 11th USCT for a term of three years. His papers verify that he was born in New Windsor and not Rhode Island, as we had initially suspected. John's obituary also verified that he served in New York, uh, or the Rhode Island troops. You'll see the obituary that he was in the 14th Heavy Artillery, and while his pension card says that he was in the 11th Rhode Island. Both are correct. And just as in modern day, military units were reorganized constantly and changed numbers accordingly. The 14th became the 11th and even the 8th at one time, and John's muster cards consistently show this change. Most, in most interesting to me is that his wife Rebecca's headstone shows that she is the wife of John Earls and that is engraved with John's regimental information. It's somewhat unique and especially so in our cemetery. Another interesting soldier and sailor in our cemetery is Theron Powell. Theron's uh, pension cards showed us that there was much to learn about his time in service. Not only did it indicate that he was in the 20th USCT, but that he also served in the, cemetery, in the Navy as well. Theron's New York State muster roll summary showed that he deserted on May 14, 1865 in New Orleans, which was a bit preemptive on his part as the USCT 20th mustered out five months later in October. <laughs> William Halsey, John Kimback, and William Henry Quimby of Company C were all together until the companies disbanded. If you remember from a few slides ago, the 20th served as part of the occupying force maintaining union control over Southern Louisiana and the Florida Panhandle. Theron would have been there in the same Company D with William Halsey and John Kimback. However, in Theron's file, 
we find another card that looks similar to a mustard card, but it's actually a notation card that shows in, 19, in 1898, Theron petitioned to have his desertion charges dropped against him under the acts of Congress for the relief of desertion charges. That is a big long name. <laughs> there are two sets of provisions, one in 1882 and another in 1889, that allowed for the removal of desertion charges under certain circumstances. For Theron, he received his discharge and it was backdated all the way back to May 11, 1865. Theron's 1877 naval enlistment had some more surprises for us in store uh, in that he had supposedly been living in Richmond, Virginia, working as a bricklayer when just two years earlier in the 1875 New York census, he was living and working as a servant in the John Mangan farm in Blooming Grove. But more surprising was the mention of Theron's multiple tattoos, including a coat of arms and the USCT lettering. And Theron still had even more surprises in store for us. A brief mention in 1877 from the Warwick Valley Dispatch shows that Theron was visiting after being gone for nearly eight years from the area and boasts that he had gone around the world with the US Navy and had been working on the railroad in Panama for the past 18 years. By the 1900 census though, he was living back in Washingtonville as a widowed boarder. On March 1st, 1902, Theron was admitted to the soldier's home in Bath, New York. The scars mentioned on his naval enlistment could be from the bayonet wound from the war that was mentioned on his intake form here. He also suffered from rheumatism and bronchitis since the war had ended. Theron would live at the soldier's home for 12 more years before passing away on October 7th, 1914, bringing to end a very long and very interesting life. The final soldier I'd like to talk about tonight is Morris Woodhull, who served in the 26th USCT and his story was of particular interest to me as he shares the same surname of my relatives here in Orange County. I feared and was correct that Morris's family was tied to the slaves of the Woodhall family, but more about that in a moment. Morris was one of our soldiers who received a new VA replacement headstone last fall. His had laid broken for eons under a large pine tree and we honestly believe at some point it had just been tossed there to get it out of the way of the mowers. Now he's a shiny new beautiful one that was installed next to Sherry's grandfather, Henry Bruin. Linda Standish firmly believed that this was his original burial spot and was just adamant that they should be buried side by side as they died within three months of each other. So that's where we placed him last fall. The town clerk's office had a summary style register of the soldier's time in service. And here, Morris gave clues about his life that were missing from his muster cards and the papers on fold three. Here we see that he was born in Hamptonburg on August 15, 1826 to a Leonard or Leonard Odell and a Nancy Greensleeve. You might be asking yourself, how was Morris's last name Woodhall, but his dad was an Odell? Wouldn't that make him an Odell? As a longtime Woodhall researcher, I knew the answer to this question. Woodhall has an exceptionally long history going back to Baron Folk Woodhall, who was the Sheriff of Nottingham at one point. The Woodhall name went through several variations through the years, including Odell. This led me back to one particular person in Orange County. Colonel Jesse Woodhall raised the first Orange County militia during the start of the revolution. He became a sheriff of Orange County and even served as a member of the New York State Senate. He was also a delegate to the New York State Convention to ratify the Constitution. He was a presidential elector in 1792, voting for George Washington. All things considered, he was a semi-big deal here in Orange County at the time, and he came from a fairly well-off family in Setauket. At one point though, and most poignantly to this story, he owned the most slaves in Orange County. When Jesse died in 1795, an inventory of his estate, along with all the animals and land, is a list of slaves that he assigned to be given to his wife and children. In that list is a four-year-old boy named Lunan, who would have been born in or around 1791, that was given to his son Richard. I formulated a theory and set about to prove the connection between this slave boy and Morris Woodhall. I began to search for this Lunan. From Morris's enlistment registry, we knew that he was supposedly born in 1826, so I started with the next census, the 1830. Lo and behold, right there in Hamptonburg, where Morris said he was born, is a Lunan Woodhall next door to a Garrett Greensleaf. If you haven't remembered from the enlistment form, Morris said his mother was Nancy Greensleeves. It's not a far stretch from the imagination to make green sleeves to green leaf. Also more tantalizing is that there's a Henry DeWitt listed above their names, 
And we'll see why that's interesting here in a second. The 18, 1840 census was a bust for Lunan, but the 1850 found Morris married and with a child in Goshen. The 1840 also did not find a Lunan, but we did find still in Hamptonburg, a Leonard O'Dell in the 1850 who was born in or about 1790, just like the slave boy from Jesse Woodhall's estate. You might be asking, but why the swap from Woodhall to Adele or Lunan to Leonard? Ask yourself, would you wanna keep your slave given name? Many did, sure, but many also changed their names when they could. So could Lunan Woodhall be Leonard Odell? We think it's more than likely. And remember Henry DeWitt from the 11th Rhode Island we mentioned before? After Morris died in 1869, his widow Harriet Depew married a Henry DeWitt. Harriet was interesting in her own right. She reportedly was a Civil War nurse and was nearly 100 years old when she died. Could it be that her second husband, Henry DeWitt, was a son of the Henry DeWitt that lived next door to the Loon and Woodhall and their boys grew up together knowing each other? It's entirely possible and so tantalizing to ponder that connection between all of them. As I wrap up my portion of tonight's presentation, I wanna show you just how amazing these men were as this article shows from August, 1864. After all the hubbub about not arming black soldiers and how the early people didn't think that they believe that they would fight well, this article sums it up nicely about how wonderful they really were. New York has sent many a white regiment to the war, which will return to their native state after a three years absence from home and will not take up so half a glorious a record as the 26th regiment can take home after being out five months. What amazing praise. Much here is said about the 124th New York Orange Blossoms, but in my mind, the black soldiers of the USCT were the true unsung heroes. They had so much to overcome. They weren't just battling the Confederate forces, they were battling prejudice and segregation, even among the Union forces that served by their side. As I keep researching the men, the prouder I become of them and their service. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Sherry, finally. <laughs> Thank you, that was excellent. <laughs> Okay, so I'm going to start. First, I want to thank the Moffat Library for celebrating the Black History Month by honoring the Black patriots that are buried in the Washingtonville Cemetery. And that I've been, I'm real honored to have been invited to join Jill to talk a little bit about my family and my research um, into those families. Each one of those soldiers, Jill uh, had quite a bit, they have a story, they have a life story, and I'm honored that I can show you a little bit of the stories of my family. My interest began with Henry Bruin, who was also known as Harry, which we discovered when we uncovered his uh, gravestone that he was called Harry. When I was a teen, my grandfather, John Bruin, showed me this picture of his grandfather, Henry Bruin. He explained that Henry had escaped from slavery but there wasn't much else my grandfather knew or remembered. I was bitten by the genealogy bug and I've spent years in research, researching Henry's story. And I've uncovered enough to paint a picture of what his life was like. Henry served in the Navy during the Civil War as a three class boy. That's an assignment that was generally given to slaves or former slaves. He had seized the opportunity to escape slavery as the Union Army fought between Baton Rouge and Point Coupe, Louisiana. He was picked up as contraband by one of Major General Nathaniel Banks' warships participating in the siege of Port Hudson along the Mississippi River. It's likely that Henry's role on board the Essex was as a coal heaver to fuel engines. That was a very dangerous job. After the surrender of Port Hudson, Henry and the other contraband that were on board the Essex were encouraged to join the Navy. On July 14, 1863, Henry enlisted in the Navy at Port Hudson and thereby, thereby joined the War of Rebellion. He was assigned to the USS Richmond, which was headed to the New York Naval Base for repairs. Once in New York, he was transferred to the USS North Carolina, which was a receiving and training ship for new recruits. Once his service was up, Henry ended up in Blooming Grove, where he married Amelia 
and raised a family of six children. Plus he had two sons that died in infancy and the one daughter who was born two months after his death. He died on January 3rd, 1889 and was buried at the Washingtonville Cemetery. His burial and headstone were donated by the local committee of the Grand Army of the Republic. Do I have control of this or do you? <laughs> okay, there we go. My family, as Jill had mentioned uh, earlier, that has lived in Orange County for over 200 years, and some of them did serve in the Civil War. In addition to Henry, there are three others in this family circle who are buried in Washingtonville. This slide shows the relationship uh, they had to each other. Cortland Robinson was Henry's uncle-in-law. Cortland was 23 years old when he enlisted in December, 1863. He went off with the 26th Regiment. He left behind his wife of less than two years. So he's pretty young. Cortland had been a farm laborer before and after the war. Following the war, he fathered three children with Melissa and they continued to live in the Blooming Grove area. Sadly, Cortland was admitted to the county poorhouse on February 24th, 1892, with a foot that needed to be amputated. I haven't found any detail yet to explain what may have happened to his foot. He died a month later on March 28th, 1892. And just the other day, I found a funeral notice that his funeral was held at the Blooming Grove Congressional uh, Church and that he was buried there in Washingtonville. Brothers Anselm and William Halsey were cousins to Cortland and they also enlisted. Anselm was 45 years old when he enlisted the same day as Cortland. He was married to Antoinette and was the father of two young biological sons and stepfather to Antoinette's three sons from a prior relationship. One of those stepsons served in the 14th Regiment. Anselm had been a laborer and also a servant in a private home. He became ill while training at Rikers and died on February 28, 1864, before his regiment was mustered out to battle. Antoinette filed for a pension and that application revealed their youngest child had died in June of 1865, leaving one son whose name was John Halsey. Jill shared William's uh, Halsey story already. A useful resource, however, was William's will that he left because it provided the names and locations of four other siblings, as well as naming his nephew, John Halsey. Each of these men served the country and many died doing so. While slavery was a key issue in the War of Rebellion, the men of New York State had been born free of enslavement. And so as we, we talk about a lot, what would possess them or, or encourage them to already enlist um, and take a chance into going into a Southern area to be recaptured? The Southern Confederate Congress issued a retaliating, retaliating act, making it clear that captured Negroes would be either killed or enslaved. This was supposed to be a deterrent to the Negro. The call to arms was stronger. Frederick Douglass was among those respected activists, motivating black men to join the fight for their own American citizen rights. He said, once let the black man get upon his person, the brass letter US, let him get an eagle on his button and a musket on his shoulder and bullets in his pocket. There is no power on earth that can deny that he has earned the right to citizenship. There were black owned newspapers calling for black men to serve. The North Star, Frederick Douglass's newspaper and the weekly Anglo-African which was published by abolitionist Thomas Hamilton and his brother Robert Hamilton in New York City. While technically free, the black people were still ostracized and restricted from total freedom of choices such as the right to vote. It is important to demonstrate that they were Americans and deserved all the rights of an American citizen. For some, an enticement to join included a cash bounty, which ranged from 300 
to $600. This was a significant amount of money for a farm laborer to provide for his family. $600 in 1863 is equivalent to several thousand dollars and would have went a long way in providing for their families. A Bureau of Colored Troops was formed and the US government vowed to protect them with their own threats to the South. The War Department issued a general order number 233 in response to the Confederate threat. It said, the government of the United States will give the same protection to all its soldiers. And if the enemy shall sell or enslave anyone because of his color, the offense shall be punished by retaliation upon the enemy's prisoners in our possession. It is therefore ordered for every soldier of the United States killed in violation of the laws of war, a rebel soldier shall be executed. And for every one enslaved by the enemy or sold into slavery, a rebel soldier shall be placed at hard labor on the public works and continue at such labor until the other shall be released and receive the treatment due prisoners of war. Okay. Moving on to the next one. The stories we recreate about them are a mix of factual and interpretive information. There are numerous resources available to research one's family. Census records are the most commonly used research vehicle. The federal census was taken every 10 years since 1790. The New York State Census was taken every five years since 1825. That gives a good snapshot of people's lives every five years. Military records and pension files are found from Fold3.com, the National Park Service, and NARA. When filing for a military pension, the applicants had to prove their identity and relationships through marriage certificates and general affidavits of family and neighbors. These affidavits often describe the person's life, where they were born, uh, where they lived, who they related to, the type of work, um, names and births of children. It is through the pension application that I learned that Henry's marriage, prior to his marriage to Amelia, and also about the death of an infant son. The process for filing for a pension was quite lengthy. Amelia had filed for a pension, but it took three years. And by that time she had passed away. So the pension was denied. Findagrave.com is the effort of thousands of volunteers who visited cemeteries, take pictures and create memorial pages. There are many books written about the war that give a historical view of the world in which our ancestors lived. I'm currently reading that one and Jill is reading one as well. My absolute favorite resource is newspapers. Here the stories are written in real time, giving you a picture of what's happening at that moment. In newspapers, you can find stories of births, marriages, deaths, and other situations. And that's where we find most of the obituaries and funeral notices that, that we become familiar with. And we can switch. And finally, the stories passed down from generation to generation are invaluable. My story started with my grandfather, John Bruin, when he showed me that picture of Henry. My grandfather and I exchanged many letters in which he attempted to answer the numerous questions I posed. I was surprised to learn he had included those letters in his donation to the Goshen Library, and now they are part of the history of Orange County. It is thanks to my grandfather that I began a mission to find Henry Bruin and identify my roots on both sides of my family. Family stories should be preserved and passed through the generations. And I encourage all of you to share your stories with the young people, even when they, they seem like they're not interested. Because in the end, we all become stories. Thank you. All right, thank you, Sherry. I just wanna to finish tonight by talking about our plans at the cemetery to continue to honor the black soldiers and how the cemetery is evolving in general. 
Last summer, Linda Standish and I met with Richard Pillar, a local landscape designer, to come up with some plan to utilize the land at the far end of the cemetery that primarily is made of sand, which makes burials difficult. Richard blew us out of the water with his plan to turn this unusable, unusable spot into a walking meditation garden with a schoolhouse shaped pavilion to honor the old schoolhouse that once stood there. We look forward to start fundraising efforts for this amazing project soon. If you've ever been to the cemetery, you might notice this big monument that was dedicated to all the soldiers of the Civil War. It was given to the cemetery by the direction of the will of John Green, who served in the New York 7th. While it is a wonderful centerpiece for many civil ceremonies in our cemetery, Linda Standish and I felt that the Black soldiers deserved some more, something more geared to their own service. Before Linda's passing, she had been researching different ideas how to properly acknowledge our Black soldiers and one monument popped out at her in particular that was dedicated to members of the 26th USCT out of Ithaca. And so she began planning a more, what a memorial would look like to the USCT men in our, in our cemetery. We envisioned a brick platform with a monument similar to this one and two flagpoles installed with the regimental flags of the two main regiments, the 20th and the 26th. The bricks could be sponsored and paid for by families or even by businesses in town that want to help honor and recognize these brave men. And here soon, we hope to start fundraising for that project as well. And with that, I want to say uh, thank you for having us and for everyone that attended tonight. Um, we certainly appreciate you um, coming and spending time and your interest in our Black Patriots. So I will turn this back over to Matt and we can start taking any questions that you might have. Uh, thank you, Jill, for, uh, Jill and Sherry for uh, presenting tonight. Uh, I have to say it was, it's mind boggling the amount of research that you two have both done in terms of just tracing everybody's, not just their service, but their lineages all the way back and the interconnectedness of it. Um, now, you, you, uh, it, I'm going to open it up to anybody from the audience. You could unmute yourselves or, um, you know, type in the chat box if you have a question and we'll start taking questions and answers. Bill, go ahead. Are you, uh, you have a question? Um, yes. Um, is there anything available that talks to what the black population in the early days of Orange County, what their contributions were to civic life and to life in general? Um, throughout the county, I, I'd love it in particular to Washington, Bill but um, that might be too, too few. But I, I'm thinking of the whole county. I, Matt, can you answer that? Because I, aside from Brennan's, I really don't know what, what else available there would be. I can say that the cemetery, one of the things I didn't mention was that we want to write a pamphlet just about the USCT men and the Blacks that are in our cemetery. Um, but Matt might know something that's already out there available or share even do you, you've been up to the the genealogical society yeah um I'll, I'll i'll just point it out there that um our library does have a few books related to um african americans in the hudson valley in general um the the one uh book that specifically is focused on um orange county and it's not necessarily um, I don't want to say it's it's an appropriate answer to your question, but it's called the Silent Rebellion, and it's about the Underground Railroad in Orange County. Uh, but that's more or less people who are white or free people of color who are helping out during that one particular episode in our history. Um, a really good survey, um, which unfortunately it's I believe it's out of print now, but our library does have a copy that's that's available for checkout. Is along hammering by Dr. A.J. Williams Myers. He was, uh, he also passed away recently, but he was a, a professor um, at SUNY, SUNY New Paltz of uh, African-American studies. And it's mainly focused on um, African-Americans and their contributions, or at least um, uh, looking at African-American history in the Hudson Valley region from the first contact colonial period, so 17th century, all the way up to the reconstruction era and the early 20th century. And for me, that was a eye-opening book 
and kind of led the way for a lot of research that I've been doing on the side, um, which focuses also on African Americans and their contributions um, in the Hudson Valley, but folks focus more on the American Revolutionary War period, not the Civil War. I think it's important to remember that during the, the late 1800s and early, there were many Black people who were still illiterate um, and uneducated and didn't have um, the education to the um, big leaders in the company. They were, they did tend to be active in their churches and doing things on a social level that way. But as opportunities did arise, um, there were more things that they would become involved with, like several were members of the Grand Army of the Republic, which served, helped to serve and support uh, soldiers. And then there were different uh, groups that they became part of. Um, Jill had talked about John Earls, who is one of those that had joined the um, 11th Regiment. His son, uh, with, along with a, a Sewell partner, uh, bought an apple orchard and became one of the biggest producers of apples in the Bloom and Grove um, area. So I think that there are some things that people have done. I don't know that there's any uh, one book that gives research. Again, it's back to that interpretive um, meaning of different facts that you uh, come across. But there, there were some activities that um, went on and as time, past and, and African Americans became more educated than they could um, be participating more in civic duties. Thanks. Another, one of the soldiers we didn't get to touch on uh, was Sam, Samuel Smith um, and, and John, John H. Um, they both served together. They were both from escaped slaves, we believe from Maryland. Is that right? Oh. Mm -hmm. Right. They got involved in the black church in Newburgh and the one became like this time, um, you know, guy and in, in, in helped, you know, bring about voting rights, you know, and he was very active in the church. And so you see a lot of his civic stuff in Newburgh, but I don't really know about Washingtonville. And aside from the Isaac Nichol GAR, you'll see them taking posts, you know, because they had like their own, you know, they would have a chaplain, they would have, you know, a sergeant of arms. And you'll see the black men participating side by side with the white men in the Isaac Nichol GAR. And you'll see them, you know, performing cemetery duties when somebody died. And, you know, so they really were, I, I think you see them more post-Civil War than you probably do pre-Civil War, at least in the newspapers in the area. And that's mm -hmm. what I've found so far. Um, and I will say, um, if we're if we're talking, you know, about maybe focused on Washingtonville, of course, um, one of my favorite um, historical figures in our area, Naomi Sewell Richardson, um, was of course the daughter of uh, Reverend Perry Sewell, um, right. and he was the first minister of the Bethany Presbyterian Church, which was an offshoot of uh, the First Presbyterian Church. Um, and she ended up uh, being educated at Howard University. She was one of the first uh, sorors of uh, Delta Sigma Theta, which was one of the first all black sororities in the US. And she went on to become a, a, a civil rights leader um, in her own time. And she ended up, she, she lived to be about, I believe it was like about 100, 103. He, she lived to be one of our oldest residents and her stone is in the cemetery. It's this beautiful red uh, granite color um, and that's symbolic of the sorority that she helped found. So um, we have her book, A Life of Quiet Dignity, Dignity and that talks all about um, her life growing up here in Washingtonville and it's a real eye-opening book. Now, when did, she, just, when did she die? I believe it was 1994, um, 1993, 1994. So where is she buried in the cemetery? I mean, when did this, I guess the, my question is, when did the cemetery open up and Blacks were in, integrated with whites? Well, 1855, it was incorporated and, you know, and, and it was built behind the manse that was there. Um, that's where the pastor resided and stuff. Um, 
I can't tell you offhand when the first burial was because like we have people that were relocated there from the Revolutionary War over there. We weren't there in the Revolutionary War. The as the farms were sold off in the area, like the Strongs and the Howes, they would relocate their family to the cemetery. So post 1855. That's the soonest I can give you a date there on that. That's that's actually um what we think happened. So I um I own the house next to the high school, which at one point in time, members of the Brooks family lived in. Um, and um, so there's numerous Brooks family. Um, there's a Brooks family large monument in the Washington Cemetery. There's actually one further down as well, a very similar one, um, the big white church um towards Cornwall or New Windsor I don't remember the name of that it's um of which church that is but it's on 94 so there's there's a, there's a similar monument there so my guess without doing that much research on that piece was that some of the family were along wanted the, a monument in that church and some of them wanted it in the Washington Cemetery because it's almost identical. But the, but I wanted to just give a little information to the researchers. So I was just doing information on the people, research on the people that um, that lived in my home. And I, you know, I kind of pick it up, I stop, I pick it up, I stop, you know, that kind of thing. And, um, but there is a, there's a will of um, a Jonathan Brooks who died in 1811. And in that will, um, and this relates to, I think, Mr. Hurley's question. It's the reason I decided to share this. In that will, Jonathan Brooks um, entrusts his youngest son, and he had other sons as well, but he entrusts the care of his youngest son to what he calls his manservant. And he gives, he says that two years following, um, I believe it's his youngest sons, who I think was 12 at the time, and I think because uh, I haven't looked at this in, in a while, so the numbers are going to be off, might be off. But, you know, like when he was like 21, two years after he turns 21, he says he grants him his freedom and proceeds to give him some acreage as well. And I just found that I always found that very telling. He names him. He says his name was Galloway. Um, and I always found that very interesting because um, he entrusted this manservant a slave who he was able to grant freedom to with with the care of his his own son um it, and i just i just found that you know very telling so i just yeah. wanted to share that with the researchers um in case there's someone looking for and it always intrigued me because there's a galloway road there are a number of galloway roads in and around newburgh um but i also know that there was a galloway that um that dates back to, you know, the, the, the name dates back to um, very early on because um, the, Brooks, the Brooks family married into the math. He, he, he marries into, he marries um, a daughter of Fletcher Matthews, Catherine Matthews, which is how they end up on my property um, because Fletcher was one of the few that didn't have his, who was a loyalist who didn't have his um, lands confiscated. Um, and probably it's probably because he was a buddy with with you know Colonel Clinton up the road, and they just were like, "We'll leave Fletcher alone," um, because instead, you know, he's allowed to, his land goes to his girls instead of being confiscated. So that's my contribution. Galloway um, entrusted with the care of Jonathan Brooks' son in 1811. Thank you. Thank you. Any, any other questions? I don't have a question, but I'd just like to um, invite anyone who is interested in uh, becoming uh, more involved with our cemetery effort to uh, please attend uh, one of our monthly meetings. Uh, we're, we're looking to uh, draw more folks in and we certainly uh, would welcome anyone who has an interest in the history and the preservation of the cemetery. Um, so our, uh, our meeting time has been uh, traditionally the first Wednesday of every month. However, we've been a little off our schedule the last couple of months 
Um, but any any change in that would um, certainly be uh, I, there's a mosquito that keeps flying around my head here. That's why I'm waving my hand. Um, yeah, to Jill, Jill can uh, certainly, you know, put a notice on the uh, Facebook page and the website um, if we are uh, off of our schedule as far as every uh, first Monday goes. We, we hope to get back uh, to that in April. But uh, it, for March, we're going to probably be meeting the second week, and it may be on Thursday because we've had to adjust for a couple of uh, reasons lately. But we want to get back on track with that. But but please, you know, please let us know through the website or the Facebook page um, if you have interest in joining us, because we sure would welcome you. And thank you, ladies, so much for all of uh, your hard work and Matt. Uh, for putting this whole uh, program together. It's been fascinating, very interesting, very eye-opening. I put the email in the chat. If anybody needs more information or wants to pass a message to Sherry, I can pass that to her if you have further questions about her family um, or if you have questions about the cemetery in general, so. Yeah, I, I just have a quick question um, and a, and a, and a follow-up. Well, a question about your research and a question about the cemetery. Um, so you did, you did all, you both of you have done a lot of research into uh, their lives before, during their service. Um, I mean, have, are you, is there going to be, I'm sure there is going to be a part two at some point, but have you started delving into their life here in Washingtonville and kind of putting meat on the bones of the census records and, you know, a couple of newspaper clippings and expanding on that? And then about the cemetery. Can you tell us a little bit more about the cemetery website, maybe ways that people can donate to it? Uh, there is a just there's a donation button. You can do PayPal or there is a downloadable form that you can mail in a check if you'd like um, or you, you could just send it to the church. I'm supposing still for right now, but we do have a, a P.O. box and that's on the website. Um, the website we've been using to do I have tried <laughs> to write a blog post every couple months that involves some aspect of someone that's interesting in the cemetery that we've found and researched. Um, we also have a newsletter that we put out every a quarterly newspaper um, that we kind of catch up on everything we've been doing. And that includes um, talking about things that we have discovered and um, like installing the headstones last year. Um, and then we found Henry Bruins there. So we talked about that. Um, the Facebook is much more active, I think, than, than anything, if you want to catch up with us on a daily basis and see what we're doing. Um, we've spent, I've tried to every day this, this month do something about Black history. Next month is women's history. Um, we'll be sharing stuff about Naomi Sewell Richards and then too, and some of the other ladies that are there in the cemetery. So we try to keep it interesting and try to bring the community in. And so uh, Facebook website, um, and that's how we've been in the newsletter. So people can do it that way. Um, um, I am uh, in the process of writing a book. I dare call it a book, but I'm writing about my search for Henry and more of the details of what I found of his life um, as a slave and his life in um, Bloom the Blooming Grove, Washingtonville area, along with uh, all of the descendants that have come from him and then the extended family um, many of them were affected by the Civil War. Um, some of them, the soldiers that were not buried in Washingtonville, but there were quite a few soldiers that came out of that, that area that are uh, distantly related um, to my family. So I'm working on a story to tell their story um, with, with more details about what their lives may have been like. And there are the social aspects of it, the family aspects, the, the losses and the births um, that, that have occurred. Yeah. They face some really hard times, um, but as the, you know, the generations passed, then they, you know, life got easier. And we got to my grandfather, who was a, a civil rights activist in the Goshen area. Um, that some of you may have heard of, he used to print uh, write Bruins hash in the Goshen yes. City. I do, I remember that, yes. Yeah, so there's there's a lot that in between that I'm working on. 
Wonderful. We look forward when you, you know, if, if at any time you want to share your research with us, you always have a platform here. Well, so, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Well, perhaps by next uh, uh, year, this time, I'll have something that I actually can call a book. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. Um, well, okay. So if, if we don't have any other questions, um, I do want to thank again, uh, Jill and Sherry for sharing their research. This was just a really great uh, presentation and very inspiring the work that both of you have done. And it's really uh, amazing to see how far the cemetery has come so far um, in honoring these uh, heroes. Um, they might have not maybe referred to themselves as such, but they certainly are in, in my book and a lot of people's books as well. Um, I will say as a shameless plug just for our library, um, we do have a few talks coming up um, in the spring. So I don't have the exact dates down, but they will be in um, on our library website, moffatlibrary.org and in the newsletter. Um, in April, we're going to have a talk on uh, young girls literature in World War I um, and its influence on, on uh, kind of empowering women during that time period with uh, Professor Susan Lewis, who's a former history professor at SUNY New Paltz. Um, and then in May, we're having a presentation on um, Asians, uh, specifically people from China and Japan who traveled to Europe and North America during the 18th century and the period of the American Revolutionary War um, and their experiences for Asian Pacific Heritage Month. And, uh, and then in June, we're going to have a presentation with uh, Professor uh, Richard Hull, who is a, um, his, his grandfather, his, his, his ancestor was a uh, clerk in Washingtonville. And he'll be talking about um, through his ancestors' eyes, the changes that Washingtonville went under between roughly 1860 and 1920. So if you want to kind of get into the world in which these men lived when they came home a little bit, uh, that's a really great presentation to uh, attend. Um, but with that, again, thank you, Jill. Thank you, Sherry. Thank you, everyone who's, uh, who attended this program. And uh, be sure to look for this on our library YouTube channel shortly. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jill, Sherry, and Matt. Thank you so much. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night.